All right. So as I as I said, we will talk today about two things. So we will talk about assignment two a little bit more, uh, such that we are on the same page. And then, but the first part, let's talk a little bit about collections. So I I guess you should all join. Uh, there are some questions that I will ask you, and then we will have a little bit of a code. Um, Code analysis. So what is a collection? So what, what are the synonym? Because uh, some people say collection is a collection of something. What are the synonyms can we use to define what collection is? Container, great, yeah. What else? All right, let's, let's have a look into the, into what do you think? So, a set, yeah, a set is an example of of a data structure which is used for collection, but if we use kind of a set in a abstract sense, yeah, as um a container is a good name. What else do we have? Vector is an again a, an example. Uh, it, it's quite easy to say, yeah, I like vectors or lists or sets, right? Uh, but if we were to kind of group them in an abstract way. Yeah, container is a is a good good way. Um, library, yeah, the library is not really a good um, metaphor because um, collections are usually shipped as a library, but they don't have to be, and it's not really a library. It's a, a collection is a a certain um, idea of uh, accumulating values. So here it was like a set of values or a vector of values. Okay, so we have some some idea. Data structures that can store and manipulate multiple values. Yes, exactly. Arrays, vectors, lists. So when we come to a programming language, we often need to use collections. Uh, there is no way we can program anything without using collections. Um, and then different languages have different um, attitude towards that. So when I first learned C++, uh, all of the collection things, or so when you learn C, uh, all of the collection things, you kind of need to do yourself most of the time uh, from scratch, right? And that's very tedious, error prone, and really stupid. So then we ended up having a STL for C++, for example, uh, because we discovered that like having a language without collections is a bit dumb idea. Um, all right, so let's go to the next one. So what type of collections you use very often? So now for assignment two, everyone is using stack. You probably didn't use stack much often before that, but stack is pretty useful. Um, vectors, arrays, hash maps, Q, yes. Strings, of course, lists. Yeah, so we do have um, we have uh, struct and classes as example of collections. 
And in an abstract sense, that would be true. You could say, yeah, they are kind of containers for storing values. And then we may need to be doing something with them. And in, in specifically in JavaScript, it's quite easy to use kind of like a, a class instance as if it was a map, because we often have methods for manipulating the key value pairs for our um, objects or structs or instances. So yeah, that's true. All right, next one. What do we use them for? All right, let's see. Let's see what you think. So I very like this answer, pretty much anything. <laughs> uh, so we basically have two paradigms over um, memory, right? We have this abstract concept of memory, of storage, and then we either have variables or have collections. There is nothing else really, right? So we either kind of access stuff through variables, which is individual things, or we access things via collections if there are more than one. Uh, so we pretty much use it for everything else. So if you need to store and manipulate the access a single value, then you use just a variable, uh, kind of a, a location in your memory. But if you need to do to deal with um, more than one, you pretty much have to use collections. Uh, so they are unavoidable. So similar data, storage, geometry, graphics, um, Game programming, management of sets of data. Yes, exactly. So everything that belongs together or is similar or is more than one. Um, so all those answers are pretty good, but this one is pretty on the point. Um, it's quite universal. All right, so let's get to some interesting things. So what are the interesting, useful functions on collections that you can come up with, that you remember, or that you use often? So tell me all the functions that you ever used or heard of that manipulated data from collections. <laughs> the square bracket, yeah. So for adding and manipulating, of course. What else? Size of stuff, yes. What else? You can only enter three? Oh, crap. All right, so shout. What else do you remember? What else can we use? Yeah. What else? Yeah, what else? Yeah. What else? Yeah. You pretty much can go through the alphabet and try to come up with functions which start with A. Give me some.
from programming languages you know. At? Yeah. At, what else? Do you know a function called apply? Or function called append? Prepend. Prepend, yeah, that's P. <laughs> we will get there. <laughs> B. Yeah. C maybe. I'm sure there is a function called back, but I was looking at begin. C and so on, right? There is thousands of them. Z. What do you remember from Z? Zip. A zip. Exactly. And zip with. Right? Zip and zip with. All right. So we are getting somewhere. It's a universe of, of functions. Which one is the most used one that all of you use the most, but you haven't listed it? Fold. Which one? Fold? Yes. No. Come back to your C and C era. Loops. Yeah, four, right? Four. And most languages is like, yeah, four is all you need. <laughs> right? All right. So now look at this universe of functions and then go back to this and say which, uh, how many functions from the cloud, from the list, have you used in those languages? Like which one was the most rich and which one was the poorest? Why is Ras not here? Oh man. <laughs> From the previous cloud world, word, word cloud, this, the, 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 this cloud, um, from this cloud, abstractly speaking, yeah, Rust is not here. Come on, how come? Yeah, I know that's a big oversight. Yeah, Rust should be here. You're not super familiar with JavaScript, aren't you? <laughs> so normally JavaScript, Rust, and Haskell would be quite on top. Uh, C++ would be kind of in the middle and then Golang and C would be quite on the left, right? So that's the, you know, generally speaking, what the um coverage of the vocabulary you can do for collections is um yep oh yeah python should be here as well and python is quite rich as well uh python is uh same as javascript a little bit lower than rust and haskell but quite up on the right so those languages which are kind of on the right and they have zip and kind of things like that, right? They are more expressive. So you can kind of express more complex things in a concise way. You don't need to use for loops. You can kind of build the complexity by using very tailored functions, but you pay the price because they are more complex, right? You need to learn all those concepts. You need to know what zip is. If you're programming in C and then you're doing for or Golang and doing for loops, then you just do for loops. You don't need to kind of do zip. You do zip manually yourself, right? So collections. Um, vector. So why why is vector straight away here? No, 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 no. Yeah, all right. So... It has those, uh, I have to kind of uh, click through this. So when we talk about Rust, we, uh, and when you read the book, they kind of cover um, three things. They say, yeah, yeah, we have collections. Of course, we have vectors, we have hash maps, um, and we have strings, uh, which is kind of a vector. Um, and then you can do everything else 
by building more complex things from library functions like sets and things like this, right? So I think vectors and maps or hash maps are the most popular uh, and most used collections and they focus on that primarily. And then things like stack or set or things more kind of um, foreign, you kind of do by some crates. So you you have a library which makes a, a stack, right? Um, you can kind of do stack operations on vectors. So they have uh, um, operations on, on vectors. And the interesting thing is with Rust that if you go to, um, if you go, so let's have a look. Uh, let's have a look into Rust vector, for example. The interesting thing is this kind of um, huge list of methods that you have on um, on the collection classes, right? So when you um, doing something with vectors, you kind of need to familiarize yourself what's possible and what is here. Otherwise, you will have a really uh, broken kind of a perception on what is available if you come from C++, for example, right? So you kind of need to go and sort of uh, just go through, like you see pop and push. Oh, yeah, those are like stack operations, right? And we can do that with a list, with a vector. Um, so you kind of need to do this. Like you do need to go through this and get a feel uh, what can and cannot be done with the with the vectors? Why we have so many of those? Why we have so many functions here? We haven't seen such a huge number of functions, for example, in Haskell. So why Rust has such a big number of functions or methods? All right. So the answer will come in a minute. Uh, First things first, vectors. Okay, so very trivial. Uh, we can um, initiate the vector by just calling new on a, on a vector type. And then already we have, uh, so let's do Rust Playground. Okay, so I've been playing with some some things here, so let's do this. Let's say I have a V. Um, so let's get rid of that. Okay. So when I want uh, V to be a vector of, uh, of I32, right? So what do I do? I would say V equals vector new but i want to enforce the type so then i say yeah v is a vector of i32 right would that work that looks legit i think it would work let's uh, do a quick check blah 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 yeah it works so i have some what it complains about. Yeah, so we are, have things which are never used. Okay, no problem. So then I can also say that V is a vector of I32 on the right-hand side. Can I do that? Of course I can do that, but it will not work. Why it will not work? Because Rust has a different syntax. If you use the type on the right-hand side, then you have to say this. It's like, why? Why are you not consistent? Why are you kind of forcing me to remember extra things? Um, why is all this complexity creeping in, right? What, what's wrong with just saying this? I don't know. Uh, but they had reasons and they say, yeah, you have to do this. So if you do this, and you try to compile, the compiler will tell you, well, you know, use this. <laughs> it's like, okay, I will do this, but I, I, I think you suck, guys. Okay, so um, what if I don't do that at all? What is V?
Ja? Yeah, so the compiler will try to infer what V type is, right? And right now, it will probably not infer anything because we don't do anything. So it says, well, you know, consider giving an explicit type because I cannot figure out what V is, right? So, okay, fair enough. Uh, we didn't give any hints of what V is. So if we say V push, um, you know, 32, what will happen? What will happen? Okay, why not? Perfect, good spotting, very nice. Okay, what will happen now? It will work, and what V will be? Exactly, so then it's a little bit like, if we did that in Haskell, what would V be? A number. It would be a number. It would still be a generic type, right? The compiler would say, ah, you know, I can see you doing something with numbers, but I'm not quite sure if you're going to use negative numbers or not, if you're going to go beyond 255, which is beyond byte. So let's just for now, let's consider it a generic number, right? Uh, in languages like Rust, you don't have this flexibility because a lot of things happen at the compile time and the compiler has to decide. So there are some default rules and the default rules for something like generic like 32 is, okay, let's use I32, right? And again, you need to know that, right? Uh, so you need to know those rules which the compiler is using such that, you know, because I didn't say that 32 is, a, maybe I meant to be a byte, right? Uh, I8, right? Um, but it will be I32. Uh, so if you were to, to make it into a specific type, you would have to say uh, SI8, right? And then you would force it to a particular type and then the compiler will kind of follow your guide. Um, all right, so that, that works fine. So then um, if I then want to access, so let's say, okay, so let's let's move on to the slides. So I am on track. Okay, so we covered the creation um, and then we adding elements. So we adding elements to, um, to our vector. What's, uh, what's another way for, um, if we were to generate this, if we were to generate a vector with one and two in a, as a literal, how we would do that in Rust? Yeah. Exactly. So, it, like let's let's so if I were to write this, um, let's say I have one and two, and then I want I don't want to spend three lines of code. I just want to have a literal which represents for me a vector which is of one and two, right? Then in um in in Haskell, uh, you would use a list for this. So you'd say you'd say this. It's a literal representing a list with one and two, um. Uh, in um, in Rust, you would use the macro. So using the macros, which kind of uh, uh, a syntactic sugar around this code um, to generate a literal, right? So then I would do, oops, sorry. I would do that. So you, you notice that it is kind of inspired a little bit by Haskell maybe. Uh, so you use square brackets to represent the, the values and then you're using the, the macro. Uh, so most of the syntactic things in Rust, which are kind of nice to use, are done by macros and then you recognize them by the exclamation mark. Um, and this, this line of code, this literal, will actually generate this, right? It will basically, the compiler will unfold the macro and generate the code for you. So, it, you know, de facto, it's just a syntactic sugar over this. There is no actual difference between doing that and doing this, right? All right, so let's delete that. This one is nicer. Okay, so then I want to access the first element. So then I will say my X is V of zero. Can I do that? Okay, I can do that. So let's go back to the... So adding elements, yes, and then reading elements. Perfect. So here we see 
we have X and Y, and we're doing uh, two different things. So first one is X is, um, so the, the, the values are I32. So it's I32, right? Is it? Okay, so let's do Y. And what type is Y? And then we say, is there a difference? There is no difference. What is this compared to this? Okay, so how can we fig figure that out? We can read the docs, <laughs> or we can make a, a small experiment, right? So we can say, okay, um, is X mutable? No. So we can print X. Uh, in this case, X will be one. Uh, so that's not much fun. Uh, we can print the vector after we try to ma manipulate X. So if we say X is mutable and X equals two, uh, and then we print the vector, like which we do at the end. So should the vector change or not? Exactly. So our final vector is one and two, nothing got changed. So as you said, it's just copies, right? So in this case, I32 is a copy of this element and it has nothing to do with the value inside the vector, right? Okay, so what about we put uh, we put that in here and we try to compile it. So it says, well, well, look, uh, I expected to get I32, but I found a reference, right? So then, okay, we say, therefore we getting a reference. And then if we changing that, we have to do this and then we rerun this. And then we look at our vector and it says, um, X is a reference. Uh, so it's immutable, so you cannot manipulate what's inside. So what we have to say is that it's a mutable reference. And here we have to get a mutable reference. So then we do it again. Yeah, programming grass is fun, right? <laughs> your, your life is to make the compiler happy. And we have the compiler happy and we're happy, right? So, all right, so we figured it out. We figured it out that we can either access the elements of the vector by copy, or we can access them by, by reference, uh, or we can access them by mutable reference, and then we can actually change them, right, inside the container. So we, we got X, we extracted X, and then we were able to change it, right? Perfect. So, so far, so good. Uh, so is there a difference of getting of getting a reference or getting a value by copy? There is a difference, right? One is by reference and one is by copy. So this one makes an extra copy of I32 to give to, to Y. This one doesn't. This one kind of points to the original memory location. What's the difference? The difference is how much memory you're using. The semantic difference, there is no difference. Both X and Y will have the value, whatever you think they will have, but there is a difference in terms of memory copies. And also the reference means that it is actually the reference to the value which is there. Like we don't make an additional copy. It is 
important, right? We need to pay attention to the memory allocations and where things are because Rust is all about guaranteeing for us that things move around in a predictable way and we in control of how many allocations we do. Haskell doesn't care. The garbage collector and the runtime system does it for you. So you don't care how many copies the runtime system makes. Here, you decide how many copies you want, right? So is this code better or is this code better? Of course, this code is better, right? Why would you make an extra copy if you don't have to, right? Unless you don't have to make an extra copy, you should not make extra copies, yeah? Sometimes it is, yeah. Sometimes passing by value is actually faster. And I have been reading um, some of the recommendations for C++ mm -hmm. and they kind of, because of the move semantics and so on. And sometimes they say, yeah, just, just do move by value most of the time for primitive things because it's faster and it's simpler and it's kind of less error prone. So it is a little bit difficult to decide, right? Uh, but you kind of need to think about it. Excellent. So then we're getting elements. So we have the, all uh, right, so let's go here. So the obvious one with a square bracket, right? We can get things with a square bracket and then um, let's get to the, um, let's, yeah, let's keep the mutable thing. So what will happen if I go beyond the range? What will happen if I do this? Panic, the program will crash, right? So should you use square brackets? Yes, of course you should use square brackets, but you have to guard against going out of beyond the range, right? An operation like this is inherently risky, especially if you have a magic number here, right? Like, well, that, that is a really big code smell, right? Um, so, you should not have magic numbers here. And even if you're calculating and you are ensuring that you don't go over the length of the vector, there might still be some issues, right? So there are two ways of accessing it. One is with the square bracket, of course. The other one is with get. And then get uh, three uh, or get index uh, returns you an option. So if you go over the range, it will return none. But if you, if you are within the range, it will return you some and the reference to that item, right? So this is what we have here. It says, okay, get me X from zero. And then I either get some or I get none. If I went over the range, then the program will not crash. There will be no panic and I will get none back. But if I am within the range, I will get some, and then inside, I will have the reference to the value of the collection, right? So it's an option over the generic type of what the collection has. Is that clear? So in, in our case, um, if we were to get, um, so let's do that. So let's, let's get, um, Okay, so if I delete all the type things, the actual thing that I am gonna get is an option over a reference to i32. That's what I'm what that's what get will give me. If you want the mutable one, you have to say mute, right? So you, you will say get me a mutable reference. If you don't say mute, it will give you a non-mutable one. So you already see that for Rust, get has to have two variants. You either get a mutable one or non-mutable one. That's why the list of functions in, in the list is quite long because of memory management, right? Um, sorry? Yeah, if you want to copy, you can use square bracket or you have a kind of a function which gives you the copied version, yeah. So there is a function, uh, Yeah. Copy. Copy. Mm 
No, that's not what we want. That's not what we want. Yeah, I don't remember, uh, but I'm pretty sure there will be a function which gives you a copy, but you can also use a square bracket. Although then you are unsafe, right? If you go over the range, then it will blow, it will uh, panic. Okay, so if we do this, then to actually extract X, we have to match on X. And then uh, we have two options. We either have sum, and then X will become, I'm shadowing X, and X will become a reference to I32, right? Do you understand the, the pattern here? So then if you do something with X, is it is actually a reference to a number so I can redefine it. I can say, yeah, now it's three, right? Exactly, very nice spotting. So I can do something with it, like I can print it, but I cannot mutate, mutate it. To mutate it, I have to tell specifically that I'm gonna mutate stuff. Perfect, all right. So, um, and then if, if we went over the range, it, it will be none and then you can do some handling of uh, going over the range. All right, so we getting somewhere. Um, so now it's a task for you. So imagine that we're doing some very trivial thing, which we have done many times in C++. So let's do this. Let's not go over the range, which go that X is whatever is the first thing. Let's do it by reference non-mutable reference. Uh, in fact, we do want a mutable reference. So we kind of need a mutable reference. And then we want Y, which is the second one, which is also a mutable reference. So let's do, let's do it like this. And we want the second one. And then we want to say Z is also a mutable reference of our last one. And because what we want is we want to say that Z, we want to set Z to be uh, X times Y. Okay. So if you delete this, this mute thing, would that code work in C++? Of course it would work, right? Will it work in Rust? No, it will not work. So make it work. What do you need to do to make this code work? You can remove the reference. Yeah, we don't need X and Y to be mutable, correct? Will that work? Just take a copies. All right. So that probably will work. Let's try. So we have Z and then we, uh, yeah, all right. So we're printing the, the final vector at the end. So then we have one, two, two. One to two, and that worked, right? So Z is the multiplication of X and Y. All right, so that worked, that was good. So what if we want to do this and we want to set X to be the same as the new Z? then we do need a mutable here. Correct? Correct. Will that work? I probably need asterisk here. Let's try. And Z is a reference I need. Uh, here as well, uh, and probably here. Okay, let's try. Right, so you're already getting into the 
mutable immutable problems. How about the asterisks? The asterisks are either not checked yet or they are okay. So we have the borrow checker problems. We cannot borrow from V mutably here and then mutably here, right? So we have a problem. So how can we solve this? Yeah. You we can try that, but it will probably not work. So if we do this, so we get the initial Z calculated. And then you are uh, what you are saying is that we have, so let's call it let new x be the value of z. So that I'm thinking can be add or let x be the new. Oh yeah, I guess it this will work. Well, we basically have to um, mutate V. We, we've been mutating V at the position or in the last position. And now in this line of code, we need to mutate, uh, we need to set like uh, a new value for V0, right? We need to set this to new X, right? Sort of, we want to achieve that. And that would require another mutable borrow of B at this line of code. And the compiler will complain that we've already got a mutable reference to V with this line. Yes. <laughs> yeah. The same point you're trying to get to is uh, uh, it, it is that all the references either need to be mutable or immutable. Correct. If they're not, the compiler will complain or you'll get a pass or some invalid pass. Exactly. So, it's not going to work, but it has to work. That's like the boss told us, write this code. <laughs> we have to have, you know, X to be the new Z and we have to calculate the Z. There is no way around it. Like it has to work. So how can we do this? It has to work. Yeah. No, but you cannot make them all mutable because you cannot borrow twice. Right. So it is a kind of a puzzle. Uh, and it is actually a surprisingly hard puzzle because as I said, like if if you did if you do this, um if you do this in C, then at the end of the of the thing, um so we have well, we, we what we basically did is V, you would say V3 is this and V, you would do V0 is whatever is it at V2. Kind of, right? So th that would be the C++ code, which achieves what our boss wants, right? And that's easy. And that's easy because we can manipulate the vector at the beginning and at the end at the same time. Like uh, the C++ has no problem with that. Is there any problem with that? No, there is no memory problem. There is nothing kind of uh, semantically wrong. But it could be, right? There could be some problems with it if we were, for example, to um, do some like multi-threading and then v2 has changed before we got to this line of code, for example, right? Um, but if we are manipulating the beginning of the vector at, at, and the, the end of the vector, end of the vector and the beginning of the vector, yeah, like in the sequential code, there is no real problem. But Rust doesn't know that, and the compiler doesn't know that neither. And the compiler says, if you're taking, uh, if you're taking a mutable reference in this line of code, then I will disallow you to do anything mutable on it until uh, you release that uh, that mutable reference, right? So you cannot have to a vector to a collection um, accessing it from two 
sides from the beginning and from the end at the same time, sort of, right? We're not really doing it at the same time. We're doing that first and that second, but because of the lock, like the, the compiler will say, no, like uh, once you, you borrowed this uh, mutably, um, once, and, and we're not borrowing, uh, look, here we're not borrowing V, we're borrowing the reference to the content of V, right? We, we like V is like, we, we're not making any actual um, uh, manipulation on the entire vector. We, we just borrow the reference to the first element. It has nothing to do with the rest of the collection, but Rust will say, yeah, but that's enough for me to pretend that I will have to block all the mutable access to the entire vector because you are doing this. So in, to prevent race conditions or to prevent any memory problems, it just blocks the entire collection, right? So what is the solution? So we, we need to do this and we need to do this um, because we are manipulating the first element and the last element, right, in, in here, right? Um, so we would do that by X and Z. No, by Z, yeah, it doesn't matter. X. The asterisks are missing, of course. So the but the logic is like do we want to achieve that, right? So we mu mutating the first one and the last one, and then we want to do some calculations, and we do have to have a reference to both to do those two lines of code. Um, and even if you if you overshadow v, even if you borrow from v after this first thing, it will still be blocked, right? Because the compiler will will tell you you cannot borrow from v because you've done this line of code. So after this line of code, uh, until X goes out of scope, you cannot get a reference or mutable reference on the V or any elements of V. Right, wait, great. So then this doesn't work, but of course there is a way to achieve that. And the way to achieve that is you have to use a special functions to make a projection of your underlying vector into a slice and tell the compiler, I'm gonna only touch the first slice, right? So our our collection is like this. So we have we have our collection. And ooh, and has one. Oh yo 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 what there is not good. So we have one two and three, and we have a kind of a E, which is the reference to that thing. And as soon as we have another reference, in our case, X to the first element, uh, the compiler blocks the whole collection for us and says, okay, X is dealing like has, you know, exclusive access to this collection, and then nothing else can have, ex you know, access to that collection anymore. Uh, if if we did the mutable thing. The non-mutable thing is not a problem because reading from the collection is okay, right? If nobody is writing to that. So if V is only a, a reference, not a mutable one, and X is only a reference to the first one, of course the compiler will allow us to read uh, from all the other elements, no problem, right? Because nobody is writing, there, there is no possibility of race condition. But as soon as one of them is mutable, then says, oh, no, 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 you cannot read. Even though I'm reading the second one, which has nothing to do with mutating the first one, the compiler will say, no, you, you cannot be reading the second one because, you know, things may happen, right? Uh, so as soon as one is mutable, then the whole thing goes to hell. So what you can do is you can do a trick. And the trick is you will say to the compiler, look, 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 it is really safe, I, I, I'm telling you. What we're gonna do is we're gonna carve a slice. Oy. So I'm gonna carve a slice um, and it will have the first element. So I will give you, I will give X the, okay, it, it stopped writing. So imagine that I have an I32 reference from X and then the rest of the list. Oh, great, thanks.
So I have I32. I have now a mutable mutable reference to I32 here from X. And the rest of the collection, the rest of the list is two and three, which is a, you know, a different reference to that, to that path. And those two things are independent of each other, right? It's not anymore the same collection. It's like two things which are kind of isolated. And then I can get a mutable reference to the first element. And then you can do um, whatever you want with the rest. You can either reference it uh, read only, or you can try to reference it with uh, mutability. Because Rust will know you're operating on the slices and they, even though they are backed by the uh, final collection, they are kind of um, disjoint. They are not overlapping, right? So that means we can achieve what we want if we if we do this this little trick. And this little trick, um, so we have to go to slice, slice. Those. You found it? Yeah. That you can, but we don't want to use dot dot because we want just the first um the first element. So let's see what this one gives us. No, this one. Yeah, that 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 would work. Um. Yeah, so that's the that's the function I was looking for. So I think your your suggestion would work. Uh, we can try that. So what we can do is we can say, get me like this. Yeah. Give me the first one. The second one is by copy, and then give me. But this one will be, um, so that will be a slice, right? And then this one is, we want the last one. So then we would say, how we get the last one? Say that again? To the dot. Probably. So, the the idea is so to use slices and the way you get it is is fine so you can either probably do that by this or so i will kind of um keep that here and you can say let x be split so let's have a look what split does so split first mutable gives you an option of the um, mutable item, which is the first one. So it kind of gives you the head of the vector and then the, the tail as a mutable reference to it here as an option, right? If, if it cannot be done, it will kind of not give it to you. So if we do this, then we have X and rest the rest is the second um so v split first mute and then we have to unwrap it to get the actual x and rest uh because we let's see again the option was, yes, so the option is on a tuple, right? So we're getting a tuple. Um, we're getting a, a, 
an option of the tuple. So then to actually get the elements, we have to unwrap it from the option. So then we will get the X, which is the reference to I32, which is the reference to this guy. And then we get the rest. And then we can get Y um, and the rest. So we say rest split first mutable the same way. And then we will say let Z rest so there is and then we have a mutable uh, reference to z so and we have a mutable reference to x and mutable reference to y and then we can do that and we don't care about the rest so we can say this, let's try. Uh, okay, so I did some typos. So we meant V. And we achieved what we wanted, right? At the end of the day. But it took a little bit of gymnastics. So I, I believe you're right. I believe we can achieve that using the slicing of the with the square bracket notation. Uh, but you also have some utility functions to help you with kind of slicing the, um, the collection in a way that you want. And then you can maintain multiple mutable references to parts of the collection, right? So it is a little bit difficult because if you come from C++, the very first time I, I needed this to, to access two things at the same time, I was like, shit, I cannot. Like, what will I tell my boss? <laughs> so, of course you can, but you have to kind of uh, do this, this trick with, um, with using slices instead of the real collection, right? Uh, and similar things exist for HashMap. And similar things exist for other collection types. So that's why, this is the reason why um, Rust collections have all those functions, because they basically help you with achieving what you want with memory management. And as you see, they have all those variations, like split it with, without mutability, with mutability, and so on and so forth, right? Uh, so that's why this is quite complex. Uh, because you do doing kind of a memory management uh, manually by by hand, and you to achieve certain things, you kind of need to to do that. All right, so we covered this. Uh, what's next? Reading elements, uh, getting elements, and I think I will stop here for the. Uh, for the discussion on collections. Uh, you can find more in the book, but the problem with the book is that it kind of doesn't go into those a little bit more complex things. So like if we, sorry, yeah. So um, it goes through the, It goes through vector strings and hash maps, uh, gives you like a very fundamental things. Uh, hash map is pretty much the same as vector, you're just getting or setting items. Uh, and then you also can have, you may want to have mutable access to two values, right? With two different keys. And you use the same metaphor. You have certain functions which allow you to achieve that. Uh, and of course we program the, the collections in, in Rust are kind of um, generic. So you do need to understand the, the generic types. But beyond that, what is in the book and what I just explained about the slicing and about this kind of a tricks with accessing mutably uh, part of the collection, uh, there is not no more mystery. Uh, so I hope that that will, um, that will be sufficient. So I want to spend the second half uh, discussing a little bit uh, discussing a little bit the second assignment. And we had a very interesting discussions on the uh, on the uh, issue uh, on, on Discord. Uh, and one thing that occurred to me is that 
I'm, I'm sometimes using vocabulary, which is a bit confusing to you. And it's a little bit difficult to be talking about the same thing if we use a slightly different uh, vocabulary. So what I thought I will do a little bit of a uh, check and we cover some, some fundamentals of, of how things work, okay? So I had a, a discussion with Oyston about if, if statement, and uh, we discussed those two branches. So I have branch, a true branch and false branch. Uh, and the if statement is in infix. So the actual parameters for if are here. And then we have the condition, which is in the postfix. So the condition comes, comes here. Um, and we have been discussing how to deal with this. And the way uh, he's currently dealing with it is he has, uh, he parses the, the program and generates like a single, um, a single operation, which has two branches. And then the single operation takes a single argument, which is the condition from the stack. And then depending on what the condition is, it will either execute this branch or this branch, right? That's, yeah. I change it from class. Okay, so that's how it used to be, okay? Uh, and then I was saying, yeah, that kind of may will work, but um, depending when this happens, if this happens on the parse time, then you cannot manipulate what those two branches are because this is, imagine this is a program, right? So this is a sequence of instructions, which is our program. And we have some instructions, which are program manipulation instructions, right? So you could imagine that you may have an instruction, which for example, manipulates those instructions on runtime. It's a little bit complicated, but you can like, for example, if statement is one of those instructions, which will execute this or this, depending on the condition. So this is kind of like a, an instruction which manipulates the program flow. It manipulates what will be the next instruction to execute, right? Um, so if is one of those instructions, another instruction which could be like this is, um, let's call it a P swap, right? Um, and P swap takes like, P swap would work like this, that it would take the next two tokens in the program and swap the order. So instead of doing one, in, instead of doing that first, it's like flip, or oh, let's call it flip, right? Flip. So instead of doing that first and then second, it would do that first and that second. So you could have an instructions like that. If you do have instructions like that, then the if may not be taking those two branches, it may be taking different branches depending what has happened before, right? In the program execution. So you have two passes. You have one pass, which is read the program. And then you have a second pass, which says execute the program. And then the order of the branches, depending on what the program execution is, might be different to when you were reading it. And when you're doing this at the parse time, then it's baked in. Those two branches are kind of baked in into this operation when you were doing the first pass. But when you're doing the second pass, maybe you, you will be reordering things in the program and then those two branches are not in that order. Maybe they have been swapped, right? So then you may need to be doing that in runtime. So that, that is like one term that I, I think was a little bit confusing when I said runtime or compile time or parse time, right? So let's go a little bit into that uh, such that we sort of understand the theory. The theory of course is quite complicated, uh, but we're not gonna go very deep into the theory, but just a little bit, okay? So the first thing is we have the program, okay? In our case, the programs are really simple. So the program is for example, like plus and multiply, right? So this is a legitimate program, right? I think the guys in Zoom, I know, I'm not sure if they can see that. Uh, it's, so it will be a little bit better if I just uh, write things here because then everybody will see that more clearly. Okay, so let's clear that. Okay, so we have a program. So for example, one, 10, 20 plus multiply. 
we have two operations and then we have uh, some arguments, right? This is this is our program. Another program that we can have is um, Marius print, right? That's another program. Another program is, uh, for example, read. There is a read operation which reads input from the user and then puts hello. Let's let's do this. So let's say, what's your name? We print that. Then we read input from the user and then we put hello onto the stack. Then we append what's already on the stack to to hello and then we print what we have, right? That would be another legitimate program that says, what's your name, Marius, hello, Marius, right? Exactly, I need spaces around strings. So the first part of processing that, uh, that program is to understand what characters are we processing, right? So the, the first pass, is to check what characters do we have and what do we do with those characters, what those characters mean. So in this case, I have a number and then space, and then I have a number and I have another number, but there is no space, right? And I will know that I should treat those two characters together as a single token and this character separate and then the white space is separate because I'm using white space to delimit things, right? Why we do that? Well, we do that because if I wrote one, 10, 20, uh, then it will be difficult to decide what, what that is if we didn't use the white space delimiter for the numbers. Is it a single number? Is it like, you know, five numbers or is it three numbers or two numbers? What is it? So we use white space. Um, and those rules of what we use to interpret the tokens, it's it's called um, lexer. Okay, so lexer is the first step of what we do to identify what constitutes a token. Okay, so we divide the um, the the flow of characters into tokens. So the first step is lexer and lexer is convert the flow of characters into a flow of tokens. The tokens are still lexicographic, right? We we don't uh, we don't mean tokens in any more sense than just characters they are still characters but we divide the the, the whole thing uh, into tokens so this is our flow so of course this is a string right I, I will not put quotes but it's a string of characters and then after the lexer step we will still have a list of characters but it will be in a form of um, token a list of tokens so in our case, a list of tokens will be um, will be like this. So one, 10, 20 plus and multiplication for the first program, right? So the lexer will convert this into this. And then what do we do with this? Um, well, we have to have certain rules defining the uh, the the tokens in, in this particular case, right? So in normal programming languages, if you say something like A, B, uh, is it a single string or are those two strings? Those are two strings because we have um, the limiter uh, in, in, in between. What about this? Just one string. This is one string and a symbol and a beginning of the next string, but we, we don't have a closing bracket, right? There are certain rules. So writing a lexer which can deal with that is a little bit complicated, right? And generally writing lexers is quite a complicated thing. Uh, we, we will talk a little bit about it in a, in a moment. So what we decided is we're not gonna deal with the lexer. I mean, we just 
want a, something which is entirely simple, simplistic, and then makes this tokenization for us trivially automatically, right? So what we did decide is that all the symbols will be tokenized in the lexer by white space. Therefore, to represent a string, I have to put white space around the opening and closing brackets. And the same for the list, right? In Haskell, you can do this. You can do this. And you can see the lexer will treat that string as um, multiple tokens. The first token will be, I mean, the, the token will be the whole thing, right? Because the lexer will understand that something which has opening bracket and closing bracket, and then it has uh, comma separated values inside is a single token. So a lexer will be able to tell that that's just a single token, which is a list, literal, right? Um, so in our case, we said, no, that's too hard. We're not gonna do fancy lexers. We're gonna do this instead because it's much easier. We just tokenize the whole thing. And then we push some of the things which, uh, which are needed to interpret it into the next step, right? Okay, so a little bit of a theory. We're not doing a lexer, right? So um, remember, we're not doing it. Like we, um, we do not do lexer. We use words, right? We we just use white space separated thing. But if you were to do a lexer properly, then you have to get a little bit into two more concepts. Uh, one concept is so what dot one is automaton what is automaton uh, what is automaton in 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 a, in a kind of a in informal language okay so let's have a quick let's have a very quick look the self-operating machine. An automaton is a self-operating machine. Yeah, okay, that's not that useful, but it kind of gives us a, a little bit of a um, thread. And then if you go to automata theory, you get into something that we use in computer science, which is the study of abstract self-working machines, right? Uh, it's, it's kind of a very fancy name. There is a lot of theory, but in general, what we really want is, is this. Um, so we represent machines and we often use them in games or we use them in our software to represent a particular state and a transition to a new state. Uh, so the, the, there is a lot of kind of complicated theory, but the concept is very trivial. The, the concept is that we have um, states. Let's, let's say I have state zero and state one, uh, and then states are represented as circles. And then I have transitions. So I, I go from one state to another and then something happens. So imagine that I have state as zero and then I have a transition to a state one, which generates zero. And then I have a transition from state one to itself. And this transition generates one or back to state zero, which also generates one. Then if I start with a zero, so the automaton always have a starting uh, state and then things just happen, right? So if I go to state zero and then what can happen? Well, zero can happen. Nothing else can happen because I only have one, one transition, right? So then I generate zero and then I'm in this state. So then what can happen? I can generate one and go back to myself. So I generated one and went back to myself or I can generate it one and went to this state. And then from this state, zero can happen, right? And so on and so forth, right? So I have possible strings. Each of those strings will start with zero because there is no other way, right? So this leads us to a new term, which is useful. So automaton, okay, so where are my notes? So automaton. And automaton is really uh, what we mean here is a finite state machine, finite state machine. 
And then uh, I have a second concept, which is a grammar. So a grammar is, um, no, so that, that is the third one. So the second one is a language. Language. So all possible strings, which this automaton generates for me, create a language, right? So in this particular automaton, I basically have a Boolean strings. I have uh, all possible Boolean strings, but the rule is that they always start with zero, right? So let's fix it. Let's fix it such that uh, we have uh, different uh, things that have either zero or one. Well, we can add another transition. We can say, okay, you can either go to this state with zero or to this state with one, but that is, um, you know, non-deterministic, like, because I should always have, uh, if I go from one state to another, only one thing should happen, right? So we normally don't do that like this. We say, okay, uh, we have, um, we, we would have to say, I have, um, I have from S0, I can go either one to ones, or I can go through zero to, to this guy. And then I, from this guy, I, 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 I have to go somewhere, right? Uh, and from this guy, I have to go somewhere. So it kind of loops back and then it can say, I can go either to myself or to this state. And in this state, I will go back to here with zero. So then I can generate all possible strings and they can either start with zero or with one, right? So the automaton defines me the rules. The rules define me what I can generate. And then what I can generate is con con called a language. So this is the language. And then this, those rules can be expressed not as an automaton, but they can be expressed as a grammar. And then it's a little bit easier to work with grammars because they don't need this kind of a graphical representation. They are sort of represented as a, as a statements. Uh, and the statements have a very um, grammar, yeah. No. Yeah, so there are different grammars. Um, yeah, so the best way if, if we go to the next term, so I don't want to spend time searching for this, but the next term is, um, so one, one, a uh, useful thing that you've been using a lot, hopefully, is uh, regular expressions. So regular expressions is a form of, of defining what the grammar is and what will fit and what will not fit into that particular grammar, right? Uh, so regular expressions is a good um, metaphor. And the, another one is called uh, Bakuzner form or extended Bakuzner form. And this is um, a language for defining the grammars. So if you go to BNF, uh, Bakuznar form, then you will see that it is basically, you probably have seen it like when you uh, watch JSON or some other uh, specification languages or even for programming languages, it basically defines rules of what expands to what, right? So this is a very simple example for defining what is a postal address and what are the parts and what the parts mean and then what like how how you expand it. Uh, and then there is one more like which is actual uh, BNF syntax itself, like what are those those rules? And then you kind of define it by uh, by those expansion rules. So you say, uh, I have, Let's say I have a string, string is composed of an opening quote and then 
followed by characters and the closing quote, and the characters are defined like this and so on. So you can see that letter is defined like this, one of those things and so on. So we kind of do uh, a definition of what is what by defining the, by defining the, um, the notation which defines the grammar, which defines the language. And then the language is checked by the F FSM, right? So all of those we skipped because we didn't want to deal with the complexity of defining a proper lexer, right? Okay, so then the next step. Once we have the tokens, uh, then we have, as I was explaining, we have two passes. So the first pass is called parser. What is parser doing? The parser takes tokens and generates. So it takes the list of tokens, which that Lexer gave us. So from list of tokens, it generates an abstract syntax tree. So AST. But in our case, the programs are mostly in postfix notation uh, and we don't need a tree, right? So normally, if you have programs written like uh, 10 plus 20 multiplied by two, this is a tree, right? This is a tree with multiply at the top. On the right-hand side, I have two. And on the left-hand side, I have an, a child subtree, which has plus at the top and 10 and 20 on the two branches, right? So we kind of uh, convert things like this into trees, and then we can interpret them because we kind of know what 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 to do, right? So in, oops, in this, oh, come on. In this particular case, uh, I had multiply at the top and here I had plus and two. And for the plus I had 10 and 20 as children, right? So you see, I have uh, terminating nodes and I have non-terminating nodes. Non-terminating nodes are kind of uh, uh, subtrees and then terminating nodes are leaves of the whole tree. True, but our programs don't look like that. Our programs look like 10, 20 plus to multiply. That's a legal program, program and it's very linear. So we don't have to represent our programs as trees. We can represent them as list because it's a very linear structure, right? And we do that in sequence from right to left or from left to right, but we kind of do it in sequence. So what I suggested is we don't do this complex of generating trees from the parser. We just use the list. So all you need to do is you have to take the list of tokens and generate some representation of what those tokens are as a linear structure. And this linear structure is your program, right? So at the end of the day, um, it takes uh, from list of tokens to a program structure, right? All right, once we have the program structure, what's the next step? The next step is we can write an interpreter. Interpreter, interpreter. Um, this guy is taking our structure and evaluating it, evaluating them, right? So it's like uh, evaluate and expression. Those are kind of useful terms that we need to use. Um, so if our program is a list, this interpreter goes through the list from left to right and interpret what needs to happen, right? It interprets all the operations. And for that interpretation, we use stack. So here we use stack because all the operands, all the arguments for our operations are coming from the stack. Or if we, for example, do program like 1020, though that means we're putting things on, onto the stack, right? Or popping. So this, this is the parse time. And this is the runtime. So parsing and running, those are two different steps and two different stages. And things happen in two different steps, in two different stages. Um, should you use a stack for this? 
you could, but you you kind of uh, be probably shooting yourself in the foot a little bit because using a list or using a tree is the natural way of dealing with that, with the program structure, right? Uh, should you be doing something different than a stack? No, because our language, our operations are all stack based and operands go and uh, put are put back onto the stack. So using here, you have different options. Of course, you could use stack, um, which has almost the same properties as a list. But I think going from uh, later for the interpreter, going from left to right in your program kind of makes more sense. Uh, and then definitely suggesting using stack here. Um, the, the stages are kind of the same. And we have concepts like uh, interpreting parser, right? What would that be? Well, we, you collapse stage three with two and you're kind of parsing and interpreting at the same time, right? Should you do that? You could, I don't recommend it. Um, you can have a compiler, right? What is a compiler? Compiler is kind of like an interpreter, but it takes the program and generates another program. So it transforms one program into a different program. So it is a form of interpretation, but it's a form of transformation, right? So our, uh, we will not do that, so not doing it. Although I was really, really planning of doing that as well uh, for a simple um, uh, calculator to convert what the calculator is doing into a web assembly to WASM, right? Uh, WASM is a very nice, very simple uh, generic um, assembly-like language which you could convert your program into the WASM and then from WASM, you, it's like a free game because you can compile it to any native code, right? You could uh, go to native by just having a WASM uh, because LLVM and other compilers, they can convert it to a native code for you. Uh, we're not doing it because I would need to teach you a little bit about WASM and we will run out of time, but uh, you can do it later, like if you're interested in this type of uh, work and if you had fun with uh, assignment two, you can actually, instead of writing the interpreter, you can take all your operations and say, what sort of uh, WASM operations do I need to generate to achieve the same effect? And then you will kind of write your own compiler for yourself, right? Um, all right, so that's the, the gist of what I wanted to say about the two phases that we're not doing the lexer. The lexer is very trivial just by white space. Uh, and uh, we're not doing the compiler. Uh, and I don't recommend combining parser with interpreter. I, I recommend doing two passes. The first pass is just for the parser and the second pass is for actually interpreting all your internal data structures, right? Okay, so that's uh, more or less what I wanted to cover. And then there was a question um, there was a question about uh, how the program should work. So let me just quickly show you. Um, and then we'll be done. So uh, be broke. Okay, so I have, I have done the assignment. Um, I actually, yesterday I found a bug. I, I have one bug in my in my assignment, so I, I was quite happy that I found the bug, so I can work on it a bit more. Um, so the program, if you go stack run, it will uh, expect a standard input, and uh, so if, if I run it, it will kind of expect expect standard input. So you can pipe an actual program into it. It will read until the end. So if I if I have a program like this, and the program can be in multiple lines, right? So that one gives 30, and then I will say divide by 10, and I will have one number, right? So that, that can be my program. I mean, the end of line has no meaning other than uh, white space, right? Um, so then if I close it, if I close my stream, it will uh, execute the program, so I press Control D to close the stream, right? And then it printed the final answer and there is no error because there is only one value on the stack. So that's what your program should do. So you should be able to run it, feed it into program, program DProc, and the DProc program uh, should have the text 
And then the, the interpreter will just do all the parsing and interpreting and spit out the final single item on the stack. Um, but I can also run it with, um, so if I say help, it says, okay, you can run it with REPL. And then um, I have the ability to do interactive things. So I can do this and then get a response interactively. And I can put two things onto the stack uh, and then I can inspect the stack. So I can say, show me what is on the stack. And it uh, tells me on the stack, you have 30, 20 and 30, right? It reads from left to right. This is the top of the stack. This is the bottom of the stack and that's what I can see. So you can say, okay, what other meta commands do I have here? And I have like, I can see the stack, I can quit, I can show myself the help and uh, I can also show the bindings because we do have variables in the language. So I can inspect what the variable bindings are. So if I inspect my variable bindings, it says there is nothing. But if I say A10 assignment, so I assign 10 to A. So now I will have a single binding, right? Um, if I inspect the stack, the stack, um, um, didn't change because I had three values and I have three values, but the bindings changed because now I have A bound to number 10, right? So if I say A, the interpreter knows A is a variable and the variable value is 10, so I will put 10 onto the stack, right? So if I do A and inspect the stack, now I have 10 on top of the stack, right? So those are the two modes of operation. Like one is just to accept the program and do it and then spit out the final single answer. The other one is for playing and testing is this kind of a REPL mode where you do it line by line and then you kind of respond. But of course, if I put um, hello onto the stack and then print it, it will kind of execute it, right? So it prints hello and then show me the shows me the top of the stack. Um, so the way you deal with the stack and the way you deal with the REPL doesn't really matter, it's just for you. Uh, the main part is the interpreter, uh, which accepts the, the programs, but you can print yourself some useful things here um, if you were to, um, to use it. Any questions about this? We have to about the deadline. Oh yeah, so the deadline. Uh, I'm I'm fine with the let's see what's the calendar says. Uh, 